Uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, rainy Thursday evening at the same time as a UH basketball game. Um, my name is Tyler Blackwell and I'm the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Curatorial Fellow at the Blacker Art Museum. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, for tonight's program, which is organized in conjunction uh, with the major exhibition, Rebecca Morris, The Ink of Bright, which is, as you all probably know, currently on view um, right down the street at the Blacker through next Saturday, March 16th. Um, we've also just, I wanted to share that we also just released a, a new um, small catalog that accompanies the exhibition, um, so please check that out if you get a chance. Uh, tonight, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Rebecca Morris back to Houston. Um, since the early 1990s, Rebecca Morris has explored the vast visual language of abstraction. One of the most significant abstract painters working today, Morris has invented an extensive array of original forms, compositional rules, and improvisational associations, creating highly considered images that simultaneously construct and disassemble themselves. Varying widely in scale and density, her works are both unpredictable and precise, often featuring an ebullient cacophony of hues, patterns, layers, and gestures. Rebecca Morris, The Ache of Bright at the Blaffer, which is uh, Rebecca's first US solo museum presentation since 2005, features a selection of 10 major paintings made over the last four years. They represent the full range of her recent practice, including both evolving ideas and newly conceived constellations of color and texture. The exhibition's title comes from a poem by the writer Martha Ronk, who's also based uh, in Los Angeles and teaches at Occidental University, um, in which Ronk describes the effective quality in Los Angeles, where Rebecca also lives and has a studio. Uh, this light, too, has played an ongoing integral role in the paintings since she moved there in 1998. Much like the sensation of being overwhelmed by sheer brightness, Rebecca finds inspiration in the nuances of optical overload. Rebecca Morris's work is held in a number of major museum collections worldwide, including the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, among others. Since 1994, she's been the subject of more than 25 solo exhibitions and has been included in over 145 group exhibitions at museums and galleries worldwide, including the 2016 iteration of Made in LA at the Hammer Museum, the 2014 Whitney Biennial, Bonifante Museum in Maastricht in the Netherlands, LAX Art Los Angeles, the Kunsthallingen in Germany, the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago, 356 South Mission Road in Los Angeles, Gallery Barbara Weiss, Berlin, and Corbett versus Dempsey in Chicago, among others. She's also been the recipient of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship and the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award, among many other accolades. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Morris. Thank you for that nice introduction, Tyler. And um, it's really nice to be back in Houston. I've enjoyed being here to do this exhibition. And it's nice that I get to see it one more time. Sorry, I feel like I'm leaning. I have to stand here for a while. Um, I can be louder? Okay. So, I know it's weird I'm standing over here, but it's weirder for me to stand there because I can't see anything when I'm talking, so I'm over here. And I also like it because you're not looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm. Tonight's lecture is, um, I thought what I wanted to try to do was talk about my work as from the perspective of the person who's making it, which should seem pretty obvious, but not all art talks are like that. And since I'm giving a talk when I have a show up, and it's a very specific 10 paintings, I wanted to talk about the work very directly. And I'm not gonna talk about every painting in the show, but I. I want to go through things sort of specifically and, and think about where they came from. Um, and it's actually sort of interesting for me to do that. So I figure hopefully if I'm interested in it, I can communicate that interest. So I hope this isn't too rando or like breakfast cereal. But um, first I'm going to read my manifesto, um, which I wrote in 2004-2005. Manifesto for Abstractionists and Friends of the Non-Objective. 
Be a force. Don't shoot blanks. Black and brown, that shit is the future. Triangles are your friend. Don't pretend you don't work hard. When in doubt, spray paint it gold. Perverse formalism is your god. You are greased lightning. Bring your camera everywhere. Never stop looking at macrame, ceramics, super graphics, and suprematism. Make work that is so secret, so fantastic, so dramatically old school, new school, that it looks like it was found in a shed locked up since the 1940s. Wake up early, fear death. Whip out the masterpieces. Be out for blood. You are the master of your own universe. Abstraction never left, motherfuckers. If you can't stop, don't stop. Strive for the deeper structure. Fight monomania. Campaign against the literal. Abstraction forever. It was first an ad for an exhibition I was having in Berlin in 2006 at Gallery Barbara Weiss. And I had told Barbara I had written this manifesto and I wanted to make a poster. And she said, I read it to her, I showed it to her, and she said, well, why don't we just make it a full page ad in Art Forum? And I thought that was pretty great because I realized it would reach more people at that point than if it was just made into a poster that we had at my exhibition. So that's what we did first. But it got back to me that a lot of people, when they got their issue, were ripping it out of the magazine and pinning it up. So that's why I think two years later, I had it made into the poster, which was what I first showed, just to give you a little history on the, the format. So that's it in the uh, art forum. I think it was the fall 2006. This is installation shot of the exhibition. And the first painting I'm going to talk about is the red painting. Um, I really like this view. And we hung that um, painting with the dashes and the silver and gold shapes um, so that when you came into the show, this was the first um, image, the first uh, effect of the show and I really like the juxtaposition of that red painting with this painting that was so different but quite similar and then the way it was framed within the doorway. Great, so this painting is an older painting. It's from 2007. It's not super big. It's maybe in the 50 inch range and this was a real anomaly painting when I made it and it uh, has a lot of ideas in it that I'm still thinking about. But one thing I kept going back to was that red square at the top. I think you can see it, it's pretty obvious. And there was just, I loved what was happening. It was just a very improvisational red on red moment. And I've kept thinking about that one part of the painting and just thought, that's a whole painting. Like that little moment is the idea for a whole painting. And also as an artist, as a painter in particular, I've thought a lot about the color red and how if you're a really good painter, you should have a red masterpiece. And this idea just started making me think about, well, what are the red masterpieces in the world and why? And I need to make one. So there, I have a bunch of ideas about what my idea of the red masterpiece is because it's incredibly specific. I can't quite explain it perfectly, but hopefully in this lecture I can do it. So this is a, a Lee Mulliken painting. It's called Festival of the Stars and Planets. It's from 1964. And he's a real master of red and yellow paintings. And I've always loved his work. And you can see at the bottom of the painting, there's this thinner white area with green in it. And that's a kind of thinner cutaway into the, into the picture plane of the painting. And then the surface is all these very, very impasto marks. And I, there's a quality and a, a primordial, fundamental, very elemental color feeling in this red that I'm very attracted to. But then there's Joan Brown, who is an incredible, was an incredible painter, who uses red over and over and over to great effect. 
And this painting is just wonderful. She was a swimmer, and this is um, a painting, I forget what it's called, I have it in my notes here, it's called The Bicentennial Champion, it's from 1976. And I love the window in it, the window back to the pool, the, the man, I guess he's diving in, all the blue, the grid. And then here we have another Joan Brown painting of a cat. And I mean, you try to make a kick-ass painting of a cat that doesn't look like a joke, but really looks like an incredible painting of a cat. And this is it. I mean, this cat is a formidable animal, beautiful, and that red background is so dense. And I love the way that the surface the cat is sitting on and the cat are are one, and then just the pink of the nose with the background. I mean, this is a fantastic painting um, and difficult to pull off a cat painting. Of course, we have Matisse's The Red Studio. My fantasy is to somehow be in a space where I can look at Matisse's Red Studio and the Pink Studio at the same time. I don't even know if these paintings have ever been together except maybe in a studio, and I'm not even sure if they overlapped in the studio at any point, but I'm completely obsessed with this painting, the painting within the painting. And, and there is something about this particular red, very specific, a kind of cadmium red light vermilion Another Matisse painting. I mean, I could just stand up here and flash Matisse paintings for three hours, but I'm not going to. Mary Heileman, these are early paintings of hers, also exceptional, the juiciness. So these paintings have a particular essence of red, and it, I would say for me it's a kind of sublime red, and there has to be a certain density and uh, um, mix of red that's the right Proportion. This is a glazed Mary Heilemann that is uh, more recent. This is a very early one, small. This is hard to see. This is a Mark Rothko painting. It's one of the um, Seagram's paintings. He made these paintings for the Seagram's building. He thought they were going to be for the lobby, but then he found out they were going to be for the restaurant and he backed out of it because he didn't want his paintings as, you know, just like background while people were eating and not to be the focus. Um, and he made about 30 of these and they're some of his darkest palleted paintings. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, and one of my first experiences with art was seeing a Rothko painting. So I have a real soft spot for Rothko and these in these really dusky, dark, dark, um, like internal body red colors are, are very visceral to me. This is another one, it's got some blue in it, but it's the quality of that red. Georgia O'Keeffe, maybe a, a sort of atypical painting, but nevertheless, the, this, these reds really appeal to me. And then we have uh, Diana Vreeland, who I don't know if any of you know about her. She was an editor at Vogue, and she um, worked at the Costume Institute at the Met. So she was a fashion editor um, at Harper's Bazaar from 1936 to 62, and then the editor of Vogue from 63 to 71. And she has so many powerful and incredible things to say about color. Um, and I'm going to read you a few of them because they're really good. So this is her apartment in New York, and she says, Red is the great clarifier, bright, cleansing, and revealing. It makes all other colors beautiful. I can't imagine becoming bored with red. It would, like be, it would, like, it would be like becoming bored with the person you love. I wanted this apartment to be a garden, but it had to be a garden in hell. If you look up this quote, they often chop off, but it had to be a garden in hell. And I think that's actually one of the most important parts because the density of this red is like you're in a kind of Hades. Um, here she is in it. This is a Botticelli painting and I'm showing it because of the next quote. She says, all my life I've pursued the perfect red but I can never get painters to mix it right for me. It's exactly as if I had said, I want Rococo with a spot of Gothic in it and a bit of Buddhism temple, Buddhist temple. 
They have no idea what I'm talking about, but about the best red is to copy the color of a child's cap in any Renaissance portrait. And there it is. So this is one of my paintings. It's from a few years ago. And I would say this idea of making what I call the ultimate red painting is something that I've been trying to do for a while. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to get an ultimate red painting, but it's certainly a great way to lead myself through making paintings. So this one started with the red border. And it's a red border with a darker red splash edge in it. And then it has some red inside of it, but when I look at it, the thrust of it isn't red enough to really be a quote, ultimate red painting. So this was one that started with that as a goal, but changed directions. Because once I start a painting, I can't just hold on to some idea in the clouds. It has to really, I have to respond to what's happening. And so if a better idea or something more powerful happens in the making, I need to do that because that's what's gonna get me the best possible painting. So this one veered away from Ultimate Red. That's a detail, so maybe you can see the red. But that quality of the border is, is got the gist of the Ultimate Red. This is another painting I thought for a while that might have been an ultimate red painting. It's a painting that I made on the floor. So the, the red underneath layer was made on the floor, unstretched, walked on, painted on, other paintings were made on top of it. Then it was stretched and then I put this thicker paint on it and then spray painted that thicker paint silver. And the windows, which are different shapes, are kind of cutaways back to the red surface. But I think at one point I thought I was gonna spray it gold, but I ended up spraying it silver because I thought that was more interesting. But as a result, the silver and it being such a, a wide and covering field really takes away the full wattage of the red. Um, so I love this painting and I think it's strong, but it just disqualified it as the ultimate red painting. This was another painting that got disqualified. It had too much yellow in it and it was very orange and it, it veered off course. But you know, it, again, it, it's just a carrot on a stick, this idea of the ultimate red painting. So here's the painting that's here at the Blaffer Show and, the, and here it is at the start. So this is like day two. Day one was putting that red down. So, I realized that I, if I was gonna do this ultimate red painting, I needed to make sure that I put, I got the red that I wanted mixed and put down first so that the majority of the painting would be red and I couldn't go back. So that's how I started this painting. And there it is finished. And for a while, I thought that this also was not an ultimate red painting. but I changed my mind. That painting comes from this one in a way. This painting was made with this gray. I did the gray first and I, I think I was gonna cover the entire surface gray, but I ran out of gray paint so I had to stop and go mix it and mix more. And when I came back, you know, like six minutes later, I looked where I had stopped and I thought, oh, weird. What a weird way that I stopped. Um, wow, maybe I should just stop, stop. Because you can't get interesting shapes like that. So what I'm talking about is like the gray field, all the, the busy stuff wasn't there. That was just rock, you know, just the gessoed canvas. So, you know, you, you just can't like make a shape like that unless you sort of do it accidentally. So I thought, well, it'll be easy enough to make another painting if I want to and just put down a totally gray field. So I'll stop and, and see where I go with this. And the introduction of the checkerboard was a, um, a kind of a, a new thing. I had been resisting the checkerboard for a while because I felt it was too literal. But in the end, I caved because I wanted to do it so badly. Um, there's a kind of flirtation when you want to do something really badly and you don't let yourself and then you let yourself. It's a, you know what I mean? It's like a, it's a 
a game of attraction. It's like you're flirting. It's it's kind of it's a little sick in a way, but um, I guess it depends how long you do it. Um, the sickness part. Um, but it, the reason I finally allowed myself to do it was because it wasn't about it being a checkerboard. It was about a different way of seeing the grid. I use the grid a lot, but I'm often thinking about the lines of the grid. And the checkerboard isn't thinking about the lines of the grid. It's thinking about the negative space inside the lines, which is then the checkerboard. So when I thought about it that way, that gave me the permission. This is a much earlier painting from 2004 or 2005, and I, I realized that both of these paintings kind of come out of this, this idea of zoning out these um, areas that get painted into differently. And the brown, I can't remember, maybe the brown was last in this, but in any case, I, I feel that they're all connected, but over very differing years. So. I'm showing this because I realize I go back to ideas and sometimes I've even forgotten that I'm going back. I have to be reminded. This is another painting in the show that might seem like a real weirdo and it is a weirdo. Um, it's like a drawing. It's very thin. Everything in it is incredibly spontaneous. Um, I don't remember how long it took to make. It wasn't fast. I mean, the, the making all of it, each part was done separately, probably different days. I will say one thing I was thinking about, a little bit literally, was I was kind of thinking about this idea of a shell and, and moving inward. Um, and it comes out of a period of time, the, the, the painting in the show was, I think, 50, 2015, and this might be like, 2009, 2010, but there was a period of time where the paintings got really vacant and I was pulling apart everything out of the work and recomposing it, leaving a lot of white area, the white primed canvas, leaving it untouched or very minimally touched and drawing a lot. And this is one of those. This is a bigger painting. I think it's like 80 inches square. This was probably the most minimal it got and this one, I wasn't sure if it was done. And so it sat in my studio for 13 months while I tried to figure out if it needed one more thing. And then one day I just decided it must not need anything or I would have already figured it out. So I was like, okay, it's done. Um, and there's one detail in the top right, which is like this dry brush. It's almost like little paw scratches up there that I it needed something there, but it didn't need a lot. It just needed a little, like, hot breath. I think a lot of the thinness of working in that body of work, which is around, like, the late 2008, 9, 10, 11, came out of doing a lot of works on paper and having this studio um, previous, this is my current studio, and having a studio previous to this one, which was on the second floor, of a building that got this blasting light, uh, sunlight in the, in the south, south facing, and it was just like really almost blinding. And I think the, everything got thin there, like the watercolors, the oil painting, and so I wanted to just show this as a way to show the works on paper I do, and I think that body of work was very affected. This is some of the watercolors framed and in an exhibition in LA at LAX Art in 2014. This is one of them more up close. They are very different from each other. They're not studies for paintings, but they are a very free, improvised, quick way for me to work. And I find it a place where I'm constantly very comfortable with mark making and color mixing and attitudes and this all carries over into the paintings where I also want to be very free and improvisational and uh, open. This is one of the paintings from that time period. This is maybe like 2000, I don't know, 10 or something. So it's canvas that's been gessoed, but it's not painted on everywhere. I've always had a studio that has a painted white brick wall my entire life. So, and I think the paintings just look really good on the brick wall. 
They make sense to me there. There's a lot of texture in the work. So that was the professional picture. And then these are just pictures I took with my iPhone of the painting. I find that paintings are very difficult to document. And if I was really being faithful to truly documenting the painting, I would need a professional image. I'd need my image. I'd need these side views, a video. It's just really difficult to communicate. So with this painting in particular, I like showing all these modes of photography and ways of how I can communicate it outside of painting. This is an exhibition that was at the Kunsthalle Lingen in Lingen, Germany. And it was called South Afternoon. It was named after a song um, by Robert Kajapaglia. And this woman he met, who was like a traveling model in Italy, was the singer on it. And it's a really weirdo pop album. Um, and I loved this music and I listened to this album a lot when I was painting these paintings. And then this is sort of the crescendo of those very pale watercolory paintings. And this exhibition, all the work came over from the US and it got stuck in customs. So I came in to hang the show and be there and was there for like six days waiting for the paintings to show up. So I ended up, you know, traveling and doing all this other stuff and eating ice cream and, you know, just waiting for the paintings to show. And then they finally got there an hour and a half before the opening. So they all came in crates, three people, we uncrated them and we hung the whole show in 45 minutes. <laughs> it was the most insane thing ever. And I love it. <laughs> I'll sh show you the pictures. So the space was huge. It's um, an industrial building. It was a train, a place where trains were repaired. Uh, so the space was huge, and they built walls for the show. And they asked me, you know, what kind of walls should they build? And I was like, I don't know, just pick something, because often if you've never been to a space before, the curator has a much better sense of the space. And I didn't want to come in and have some stupid idea that wasn't going to be knowledgeable. So I just deferred which is like the only time I've ever done that, but it worked. Um, and that she built this zigzag wall through the space, which was great because it just gives you more corners. What I like about the show is that the paintings are very washy, very drawn, very light. And then the installation was very spar and spacious. So it, and the, the space was, is very much like my studio where there's all this natural light flooding in. We didn't even turn on the lights for the show. Everything is lit naturally. And my studio has skylights uh, across the top and no windows. So I'm just painting in natural light. And this, this is what the paintings look like in my studio. And this is what they look like in the show. And that's a very rare, rare thing to happen. So I kept thinking about light and air and atmosphere, and then the way they were installed seemed to fit that so nicely. This is a show I had at 356 South Mission Road in Los Angeles, another very large industrial space. This was an exciting show. I had nine paintings up. And the exciting part was the architecture, because you could really step back from these large paintings, but you also could go up and look at them up close. And then you could see five paintings together at a time um, on one wall, which I thought was really exciting. So you had, you know, even in this show, you can't see this many paintings in one view. And it's very rare to have the opportunity to show large paintings in a place where you get uh, a vantage point like this. So this was really exciting. These were paintings I spent a year making in my studio that's like a mile away from this space. This was 2015. I've made quite a few paintings that have an oval or um, a circle 
um, conscribed within the rectangular form of the canvas. Originally, this started as a, an idea that went nowhere. I, I've made a lot of small paintings that are triangular or circular shaped, and at one point I thought I would make a large shaped painting, and so I made a triangular shaped painting that was 100 inches high. I, I didn't put a picture of in it tonight, but um, it's a very, I love the painting, but I didn't feel I needed to make any more large shaped paintings. I, I realized that it was interesting to me, but not interesting enough to kind of continue. But what I did, what it did cement was that I didn't want to abandon the rectangle or the square as a format in painting. And then when I made the shaped painting, I kind of circumvented a whole aspect of painting language that I'm very interested in, which is composition and how do you deal with this classic form of the square or rectangle as a just default given material. And instead of thinking around the problem by chopping it into a shape, I, it kind of just doubled me back down into how to deal with the rectilinear. And one part that came out of it was very interesting was to put the desired shape, if there was one, like a triangle or an oval or a, a circle or even a square, which you know, there's a, there's a painting in the show that's like a big rectangle and a black border. You know, how do I do that, this shape within the rectangle? And then what you get left with is this margin or this border area around the form. And in this painting, it's this sort of warm white co color. And the idea of creating this zone outside of the focal point of the painting, which seems like it should be the frame or the non-necessary part of the painting became really interesting to me. And then this idea of framing and where does the painting end and how do you create an ending point for the image as opposed to where the environment starts. I had done field paintings many years in the early 2000s and stopped and started thinking about the finite canvas um, and the picture plane as it's as it ends and corners, like all of these things in a formalist painting language are big ideas. And so by staying within the rectangle, I could continue mining these ideas uh, in a way that felt really exciting. So this is an example of one that, you know, has this white kind of border, but then there's literally this framic edge, which I think is almost black, a charcoal color, that's just a tiny little, almost like, a box you'd make on a piece of paper that you were then going to do your doodle inside of. And this is one of the first ones. And in this one, the quote, framic area is spray painted um, copper and gold, it quite literally functioning as a frame. And I like the way that this idea of the frame or thinking about it as a margin area is very interesting to me because you think about what you do in a margin and a margin is an area that holds the kind of um, miscellaneous and maybe the non-hierarchical -hier information. And so I think by shifting what is supposed to be the focal point of the painting and what is supposed to be the framic element of the painting is a way to deconstruct the idea of where is the zone of importance and priority. And of course, you know, you can think about people who've mined circular gestures like Gordon Matta Clark, Hilma F. Klimt. And this is um, Ad Reinhardt uh, gave these incredible art history lectures. He taught art history, I think, at Brooklyn College. And um, these, he did these lectures where he would take a form and he would show all the different images of a form across cultures and across time periods in these really uh, famous lectures. And so this is a, a kind of contact sheet uh, view of his lecture that involved circles and crosses. There's so much here. This is a Robert Mangold, just the way he's you know, dealing with a shaped canvas, conscribing the circle within it, the circle within the circle, the circle that's off. He's great. This is me. The painting, the, this, the, all the marks, that's again the painting that was made flat on the floor, unstretched, prepared canvas, but it was catching marks from other paintings and then I stretched it and then um, I painted this very thick 
painted zone margin area and then spray painted it black and white. This is a very busy painting. This is another painting, maybe 2007, where I was thinking about the circle and instead of dealing with one circle, stacking circles and then subdividing them and then really going a pretty extreme in that margin area around the circles so that now it's very difficult to determine what's the focal point, where's your, where's the subject. This is another circular painting. This one's kind of like a sundial. It's a little off. This was at Mary Boone Gallery in 2017 in her uptown space. Um, as you probably have heard, she's closing her gallery because she's going to jail. Um, so I'm pretty excited that I got to show with Mary Boone because it's just such a historical thing to have done. And um, that was really insane. And this gallery is gorgeous. Like the walls are real plaster and they're painted this Pantone color that I, I, I wrote down the number. Um, I forget it though. It's this very off bone color. It's beautiful for paintings. There's another couple years ago, maybe five, six years ago. Again, like this circle idea, but splitting it down the center and one side is bigger than the other. So it's all these little formal shifts. Um, so on the left is my studio and with some of these paintings, not all of them, I work from drawings and the drawings are quite small and I get really interested in the drawing and it's very hard to blow them up so big and to get them accurate. So I use an overhead projector and then project it onto the canvas. Um, I sort of was very reluctant to start doing this because I don't like this way of working for myself, um, but it's really out of necessity that I need to do it because I can't draw these big curves and forms because to be close enough to draw them, I can't step back and even the size of my body is that I can't make a curve that big, you know, I physically can't. So I'm making excuses. <laughs> And on the, so the, that's the painting at the start on the left and on the right is it installed at Gallery Barbara Weiss in 2017 with my very good friend Monica Baer, who's an incredible painter, um, standing in front of it at the opening. This is a, a grid painting. It, you know, this, I made this painting knowing I had the Mary Boone show and I had seen the space so I was trying to copy that color of the wall and then it's a silver grid. And I think a lot about the grid and there's a lot to think about, like where does it end? How do you organize the grid itself? The image on the left is bifurcated, it's the grid crosses down the center and a, down vertically and horizontally and then the grid on the right the center is actually one of the squares. So it's a very different feeling. I think the grid on the left feels much more analytical and scientific about dividing and dividing that and redividing and dividing. And then somehow the one on the right almost feels more lyrical and open and generous and less, less mathematical. I would say, I've used this word and people have asked me to explain it more and I, I just can't, but somehow the one on the right feels more narrative. So this is a, a purple painting. I started working on the floor on it and I had this, I had this idea that I was gonna save a little money. So I decided I would just get raw canvas and gesso it myself and then start painting instead of buying pre-gessoed canvas or having someone gesso it. But I hadn't done this in so long and even though I've taught beginning painting for 19 years, somehow I forgot that if you gesso unstretched canvas, it's gonna be all wrinkly and then when I did the paint on top all this purple, it was fantastic because the paint just puddled in all these wrinkles. So I got what was even truer to a watercolor effect because when you paint on water on paper, it buckles and if you're really wet, the paint will hang out in these, you know, uh, wrinkles. So that's what happened with this, but it was horrible to stretch. It was so terrible because it had never been stretched and the whole thing is a nightmare. Um, 
but it made two great paintings. Um, my poor husband, help, help, he's also a painter, he helped me stretch these and I, I'm actually, he just did it, I didn't even help. Um, <laughs> that's not even fair. And um, he was like, don't you ever fucking make a painting like that again or have me involved in it. It's true, this is stupid. But here's one of them, it's in the show. So this is, it's, I, I have a studio assistant, his job is just to show up every once in a while and mask, so he masked it. I spray painted it silver, and then you can see that I'm kinda, that's a shot of it starting to get revealed. And then there it is on the left. And then I made a second one, and it was very important for me to do these two versions. I don't normally do things like this where there's two versions, but um, the one on the left is a smaller, tighter grid. It's busier, but you can see that the grid goes off the canvas it, it, as if it could continue. It's an expansive infinity grid. And then the one on the right is a larger painting. The grid are more horizontal shapes, and there is a border edge on the edge of the picture plane. So they have very different energies. One has a very condensed, tight energy, but then <sighs> goes off on the side as a release. And the other one has all this breath inside of it, but then has this stricture at the edges. This is the black painting. So this is an example of, you know, putting a rectangle in a rectangle. And then there's that little black, uh, sorry, that red and white. Do, 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 do. And I started it, you can see how I started it. Again, it was like a painting, I, I, I feel like I really like to do a black painting every once in a while, even though I realize this isn't really that black, but it, it's a black painting. Um, so I did the black first to make sure I wouldn't back away. And then I worked down. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, what, what time are we? Right now? Oh, I'm good. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the color pink. Um, I'm really equally obsessed with the color pink, and here's that painting I mentioned, Matisse, the Pink Studio. This painting is in St. Petersburg, and one day I'm gonna go to St. Petersburg to see it. Oh, it's so good. All those, I mean, the purpley pink, the hot pink, the yellow, I mean, it's just like, and then all the colors that shift the pink are in the painting, like the blue, the yellow. And then it's his studio, and you have the view out the window, and the grid, and all. it's just like, makes me bonkers. Then this is a Joan Schneider painting I just recently saw at the Felix Art Fair. This painting, this is the professional shot of it that the gallery gave me after I begged them for it. And I would buy this painting for myself. I think they told me how much it costs. It's not, I mean, it should be a lot more, but it's incredible, and it's as, like, gnarly. Um, this is gnarly, this painting, and it's pink. And I just feel like there's a really visceral quality to the color pink. And when people talk about the color pink in a critical way, I, I think that it has not gotten the kind of gravitas and deep read that it should get, and that it also gets caught up in all this gender discussion, which, you know, is okay, but I think it's, it becomes a, a wall to get someplace deeper. And this painting, to me, I think takes us to that deeper discussion and off the surface. So, I, I, hands down. These are my pink paintings in process in the studio. Howard Dina Pindell. She, this is one of her works. You can see it's from 1977. And I, I wanted to share this remark. She said recently in an interview, my use, my use of color goes back to Joseph Albers. I took his color course when I was at Yale in the late 60s. I remember that a woman artist would be criticized if she used pink. If a man used pink, it was considered a mixture of red and white. So the language of critique changed depending on the gender of the artist. When I noticed this, I started, I started using the things that I was told not to, glitter, pink. That was my way of resisting. These are my paintings from graduate school in pink glitter, and I felt the exact same way. It was the 90s, and I was making very feminine, kind of girlyish work, so 
that was the apt critique that I was given, but I was furious about it and really angry nevertheless, and you know you're like 20 something, so you're kind of uppity about this stuff, and I, I changed my work a lot to avoid this kind of discussion, um, but the, the goal, the, the way that what I wanted to be able to do ultimately was to make a pink painting that could, you know, like what Howardina Pindell is talking about, to make a painting with pink but not have it be always about pink, but have to be about white and red or, or other things or not always have to go back to my gender or my identity as the source of this. And I mean, I think I'm doing that now, um, but then I was trying to figure it out. This is another really early painting of mine from graduate school when I was a realist painter. There's this bathroom in Germany at my gallery there and I became obsessed with this color and it's all formica and then painted and I was just like, what is this crazy color? It's this weird pinky, strange, fleshy color and I met the architect and I talked to him and I was like, what is that color in there? And he laughed, and he's German, and he, he's like, oh, it's uh, three kinds of powder. And I just thought, wow, so interesting. I, have n I don't know what he meant. <laughs> but I liked it as, it didn't, it, that was enough. That's all I needed, three kinds of powder. So it reminded me, I had totally forgotten that I had a Mauve Association of America club when I was in high school as a junior. Me and my friend JR started it on the bus um, and we made Mauve club cards on Formica samples. And our club, it was called the Mauve Association of America, I forgot about it and when I was trying to remember the club I remembered the name wrong and it I forget what I think the name is now, but we'll come to it. The Mauve Club of America, I think it's called, or the Mauve Association. I forget. Yeah, this is the Mauve Association, the MAA, and now I call it the Mauve Club. Anyway, when I remembered this club, it was really helpful because it helped me remember why I had, it was just fascinating that I'd already been thinking about this color, but not as an artist, but just as a teenager. So there was something about this color that was just in me. You know, so when I realized that I had been interested in it then and I was completely obsessed with it now or maybe not so much now but in the recent now and I could never think of what the color of this pink was and when I realized it was mauve that was really helpful. So these are several pink paintings. These two paintings I made at the same time, they're the exact same size and I started them with the same parameters um, and they each came out, you know, differently but in sync. I think they're like 69 by 70. They, one got finished earlier and left for an exhibition and then the other, um, I hadn't finished so I, then I, I think I finished it a month and a half later and I've never seen them together since so maybe one day it'll this is the first time I've seen them together, like this. And then I made this painting. I made this painting because originally I wanted, let's see, does this go back? Yeah. My original idea was to put a gold border on these, but I backed away from it because it seemed too gaudy. But after I made these two, I just was like, okay, now you can make the gaudy one. This is, so maybe it helps you understand this painting that's is in the exhibition that is a, a version of it but with silver and less pink. This is the large tarp painting that's in the show and this is it in progress in my studio. So it was a, again, a prepared canvas. This one I bought pre-gessoed having learned my lesson with the purple one. And it's just a huge piece. I forget how long it is. You can kind of see how long it is. And I thought I was just going to work on it like this and then eventually cut it up to make small paintings. But I realized that it actually was good, it was so good as a whole that I couldn't bear to cut it up. So when I measured out what the size was, 
I then sort of draped it on a, the biggest painting I had in my studio and laid out what I thought the part of it would be, and that's what it was. This was sort of the test, and then I measured, measured it, sent, you know, got the stretcher bar. This is the stretcher bar in my studio. It's really big. It's like the only place it could fit in there. And we stretched it. And then it was so big we couldn't photograph it. We had to turn it sideways, photograph it, and then, you know, Photoshop it up. So two things. First, I'm really thankful I had this show because um, neither, none of my galleries at that time could have shown this painting because it's 152 inches tall. And I had no institutional shows on the horizon. And even so, not every institutional venue could have a painting that could fit there. And when I got the invitation for this show and I heard about that gallery, that main gallery that's like 30 feet tall, I was like, yep, I'm doing it. I, I'm, this is fantastic. This, I can show this painting. Um, so there it is. I thought it was going to be in my studio for 10 years. And then I had a friend come over and she was like, oh wow, it's like that other painting you made. And I was like, which one? And she remembered this one. And I was like, oh my god. Yes, it is. So this is another tarp painting, but instead of leaving it with just the marks that were catching from other paintings or tests, etc., cetera, um, I enamel painted out this uh, trying, you know, the shape that makes the tarp, the triangle. I made a series of paintings with these dashes and they each came out very differently. So these are the four very different energies. This is the lobster claw painting that's in the exhibition. It's not a lobster claw, it doesn't reference shellfish or anything, um, but there's something about the first painting like this that just felt like a claw, and so I've just called them that. This is a painting from 2003, maybe, and this is not a lobster claw painting, but when I look back, I think this is a precursor um, it has a lot of the ideas I'm thinking about, which is how do the shapes fit together in a very uh, conscious way within the frame, like a kind of displayed frontalism in the composition, things acknowledging the edges of the canvas through the corners or a, a start of these framic ideas. And then this is the first, quote, lobster claw painting. And this is it in the 2006 show that was titled after the manifesto in Berlin. And this is the collector Valeria Nepioni who bought it. She's Italian, lives in London, and only collects women artists. And I would see this, she had, this is a great photo, I mean, and it's cool to see it in her house. And I kept seeing this photo because I guess it was a professional one used in some press about her and I kept seeing it and it reminded me of this painting and I was like, God, I just want to make that painting again. So I started doing all these drawings trying to make the painting again or figure out, like, there was unfinished business in the compositional structure. So I started doing all these drawings. These are some of the drawings. And then I made sort of like the second lobster claw painting and this is what that is has the border and a kind of a central claw shape in that dark red. And you can see my interest in red here. It's not predominant, but it's there. It's a detail. The paint, I'm using very thin, washy, turped out oil paint. So there's Lobster Claw 1 and Lobster Claw 2. And it was in the Whitney Biennial, and there it is there. And then this was maybe Lobster Claw 3, maybe, I don't, you know, that's in my studio. I was thinking of this scalloped border edge. The scallop was a shape that was interesting to me. It's a sort of circle, circle. And then this Lobster Claw, and especially this hook shape, they all 
feel to me like shards, like if a circle was blasted um, apart, a circle would break into these claw-like shards. So the scallop and these claw shapes both, for me, come from a circular motif. This is sort of you know, a different lobster claw painting. This one has a different kind of dynamism because of the way that it doesn't have a, cons a, um, a real push at the picture plane edge, especially at the top, whereas you know, this one has this kind of built-in frame with this pinky border, and then this one goes right off. So the energy is like whoo, right off the painting. I had that one upside down in my studio at one point and I was like, oh wow, what a great composition. It's really good upside down. So then the next lobster claw I developed based on that one on the left being upside down. The paintings are always coming up and down, up against the wall or down on the floor. So sometimes they go up upside down or different things happen because they're being moved or moved around the studio. So this helps me see things and get ideas for other paintings. There's all this shifting going. It's not like the paintings stay statically in one place while I make them the whole time. These are some like in-progress shots. I've shown you this painting, but this is, you know, another claw. And a detail. So it's always so abrupt when you end a lecture, and I'm like, you feel like, you know, there's an aspect of this is sort of performative. So it always feels like, ugh, it's over. But because I started with a piece of writing, I, I thought I would read to you this text that I wrote on the occasion of a College Art Association conference. It was in 2010, and there were a bunch of different artists on the panel. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering everybody, but Molly Zuckerman Hartung was one of them. Michelle Grabner organized it. Um, uh, Judy Ledgerwood. I'm remembering all the women and none of the men. This is very bad. Okay, we'll gloss over that. Um, but I wanted to read this because I read it again recently and there's, you'll see what I mean. So in, it's 2010. And the, the, what we had to do is we had to write about painting, but we were not allowed to show any images. So this is what I said. I said, making a good painting is one of the hardest things you'll do. When I see a really, really good one, I am reminded of this in a way that hurts, like a punch. At Dia Beacon, there is a Robert Ryman room that stands as visual testimony to this fact painting hard as hell. Specifically, it's the small Ryman canvas with the drawn charcoal grid that caused me, causes me this acute pain. Simple, smart, easy, brilliant. What's nutty is how different the Ryman collection is at the Holland von Neue Kunst in Schaffhausen, Switzerland, which is now closed. This museum is the Swiss doppelganger to Dia Beacon. Both have their 1960s, 70s art installed in converted industrial buildings near rivers. Where the Diaz Ryman collection is all minimalism and purity hung in one unmodulated row, Schaffhausen's Ryman collection is freaky deaky. It is about every whack ass exception Ryman and then showing them salon style. And I should say that I later learned that he installed those there. That was his personal installation, which I think explains why it's so great. Where happiness holds a bad reputation in contributing towards good art making, I believe that joy, a totally different experience, is the real secret to good painting. One of my most joyous experiences of 2009 involved a trip via the Evelyn Car Service from Clinton Hill, Brooklyn to Penn Station. The immaculate all black Lincoln Town Car arrived at 7 a.m. sharp, and the driver, a man in his mid-50s, was equally sharp. Sweater vest, tie, driving cap. I sat in the soft, cushy leather upholstery of the back seat, rolling along the floating suspension system of this big American car, while George Benson's Give Me the Night played on the radio. The flow of the car, the music, and New York City became one, and I literally felt a tear of joy run down my cheek. These days, all I have to do is play that song, and I can channel that moment and feel invincible. 
In Manhattan, there is a Trump building somewhere on the Lower West Side whose lobby displays several insane Frank Stella wall reliefs. These works alone cause me panic and admiration. They break away from any decent and cogent sense of aesthetics and outdo the 80s before the 80s even existed. This particular lobby space is a mausoleum of marble. I believe five different varieties are present, laid down in stripes of cream and veiny green bog squares on the floor. There are sheets of marble lining the walls, each with a stella firmly mounted in its center. The space is vast and ugly, the architecture ridiculous alone, and even more so in combination with the paintings. Everything is a total mess, a, a completely horrible, fantastic, and wonderful mess. Intention. This is the tricky thing in painting. You spend the first part of your life as an artist trying to develop it. However, once you grow, grow up a bit, get out of school, live some life, stop talking, and just do, you hopefully catch on to what your work is supposed to be. But soon enough, you know too much. You know how to think, what you're likely to do, and if it's a really bad case, you even know how you'll erase and undo. So how do you catch a break from your own intention? This is the problem for the mid-career artist. You need to figure out how to approach things in new ways, working against yourself and possibly without letting yourself knowing that this is your plan. The work you make during the brief period of getting close to fully understanding your intention while not having it down all the way are those ama amazing early moments of one's work. These can never be replayed or redone, which is why they are filled with so much magic and potential. The struggle is visible and it looks great. You can feel the thinking. An example of this might be Eva Hesse's sculptural wall works, which she made in Germany in 1964 to 65, right as she segued into sculpture officially. The work vibrates. In my most recent work, and this is, you know, nine, you know, a while ago. In my most recent work, I have been concerned with the elemental forms that are significantly earthbound. I am building a language through intu intuitive marks, shapes, and colors. I don't know if it's a kind of hieroglyphics or symbolism. It's not clear to me right now, and at this point, I am not so sure it needs a name or a category. I am just aware of being involved in some sort of searching, a separating out of forms. In my mind, I see these forms as being pulled out of a hulking mass and then dispersed once again, in fact, sprinkled. This act of sprinkling is a kind of new composition compositional format, and I'm still in the thick of it, so it's all very nerve-wracking. I take this as a good sign. I started by saying that making a good painting is the hardest thing. The trick, of course, is to make more than one good one, or at least to go down trying. And in my thinking here, the opposite of good isn't bad or even failure, but mediocrity, the darkest of categories, the evil lord who is always lurking. Failure, it should be noted, is a kind of progress, and in the best case scenario, it's an educated step backwards or sideways. So smother me with failure so I can charge back up and out again, oh the high. But the challenges keep coming, so you've done a few shows, worked for 20 years. How do you pull off a ninth solo show, or 15th? These are the issues dealt with in the lifelong practice, the one I have signed up for. Please wish me luck. Thank you. I don't think I'm a writer, but I've always written, yeah, yeah, I've, um, I've kept a journal most of my life, which I thought would be really exciting to read, and I've read some of it, and it's awful. <laughs> so I've always written, but it's hard to write. You know, this used to be such a good question. I used to listen to music when I paint it all the time. I stopped. I don't know what happened. It's like, I've been trying to figure out what happened. It's not your question. When I used to listen to music, I'd listen to a lot of stuff. Like I'd listen to serialist music. I would listen to, well, what I really did was if there was a song that was really working, I would play it on repeat. 
and it could be like six hours of this one song, but the idea was that it had a certain energy and you know, songs, pop songs are sometimes only four minutes long. So then you had that really great energy for four minutes and then the next thing happens. So by putting something on repeat, I could kind of keep an energy, you know, but lately I, you don't feel like I have anything. Um, it's, 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 it bothers me a little bit. I, 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 I was like, am I depressed? I'm not depressed. I think it's, maybe I got really purist and I thought that there was something about the music that would pitch my mood in painting and that there would be an artificial effect from something happening in the music that would spur something instead of directions happening in the mood of what I was making and that somehow the painting was, I mean, sorry, that the music was, um, yeah, like like leading. What do you call that when something's like, uh, what's that? Influencing. Yeah, like art of like influencing in a way that was top down. I don't know. But I think the relationship between art and music is very important and very strong. And I, you know, like I said, my dad's a composer, so I grew up with music constantly. Um, Yeah, I, I didn't go to art school for undergrad. I went to a liberal arts college and they had a very strong studio program, but in a way I just didn't have that really hardcore BFA art experience. So I was really catching up in graduate school. And so I feel like when I got there, I wasn't even really working on all four cylinders in a way. You know, I hadn't explored everything. I, um, I was smart and curious and ambitious, but my repertoire of what I had done was limited. And I quickly saw what was happening around me and was already feeling sort of frustrated with my work and stuck. And I was feeling, felt so stuck for maybe two years, I was in school for three, that it was really horrible. And I didn't feel like myself. And I didn't know, you know, I'm like 23, so I didn't even know who that was anyway. But I wasn't getting close. and. A couple things happened and I suddenly realized I was just working in the wrong language. I didn't want to be a realist painter and all the things that were required to be a realist painter weren't really think I could do it and I liked it and it was like a job. It's like a list. Okay, here's what you got to do today, you know? And then, oh, that shadow's wrong. Mm, got to fix it. You know, like this idea of there's always this master over your shoulder and the master was never me. Um, and then I saw a Robert Ryman show is in 93 at MoMA and I was like, oh, this is abstraction. It's this simple. It wasn't that hard. And I saw a Fred Sandback show with these string pieces at Dia in New York. And I was like, blew my brain to see this articulation of planes of space created where you just walked into this massive uh, warehouse space and you would just like immediately <laughs> like space just with string and I, was like, oh my God, you know, things like that. And um, seeing this Russian constructivist book show also at MoMA, where I, you know, I had known about it, but then seeing it in the printed form. So all these kind of experiences of looking at art and thinking and Mary Heileman's work was super important. Like just how like, oh, it's so easy. It's so casual. It's so free. It's so direct. And I was just so uptight and thinking too hard and thinking, all the questions, I wasn't asking any of the right questions and I was looking for answers. So I just had to, I just needed more time. And that's what I did in school. Yeah. What was your inspiration when curating this specific exhibit that's being done here? Um, well, it's, you know, th there are, uh, I think, five paintings from 2018. So they were all kind of in my studio at the same time. So they made sense together. They overlapped, they're in the same, they had, they were like, I was used to seeing them together and they made sense. But I didn't have enough new paintings and so we went back, you know, a few years. And so then we just had to figure out what fit with the current work. I mean, in a way, anything could fit, right? But, but you do have to make choices. So we were trying to think of what was, we knew was coming and what was new and how to sort of create a dialogue with the new, with 
stuff that's still newish, but maybe didn't literally overlap in the studio. So it was just kind of, I mean, we, we, I came out here in August. We had, it was really like a mind map. We had these printouts, and we were walking around the gallery and pinning stuff up and trying to just come up with what felt right. It's pretty intuitive. So, yeah. You mentioned a couple of times that one painting picks up the marks of another painting. I'm just wondering how that happens in the studio. So when a painting like that happens, there'll be that unstretched canvas on the floor. And because I paint on the floor, other paintings go on top of that. And so it becomes like a, a carpet underneath it. And I always have a, a, I've always had paper down because painting on the floor, the floor can be very distracting. So if I have like a white paper everywhere, it just makes a clear sight line. And the paper would, I noticed a long time ago, the paper was collecting all kinds of interesting marks that I wasn't taking advantage of. But if I rolled down canvas, I'd be catching all of it. And I didn't know what I'd do with it, but at least I'd have it as an option. So that's how it starts. And then, you know, I forget it's canvas. I'll do tests because if I'm trying to test a color, I don't want to test it maybe on the real painting, but I have like gessoed canvas right next to it and I can just do something or I'm cleaning a brush or a brush has too much paint on it, so I wipe it off, stuff like that. I don't always have them going because they still have to function as a surprise. They can't be like a system that's always going on or they sort of lose their power. But. The paint is so wet, if I painted vertically, it would all come off. So I want this um, aqueous, it's not, I can't, shouldn't use the word aqueous because there's no water, but this very, this liquidity, and the only way to have the liquidity just not go crazy is this flat. And I've been painting flat since grad school. I, I just thought the easel just didn't, I, I just didn't understand the easel. And yeah, it made sense when I was painting realistically and I was sitting there. But then that all got, you know. Does it ever surprise you then when you lift? Every time. Right every time. And I have a ladder that I can climb up and look down. And even doing that, it's always a surprise. So it's, it's painful. Sorry. It's painful, but um, every time I do something, even super small, I have to then lift the painting up once it's dry. So it's f stupid. Right, so I paint something, I have to wait three hours for it to dry. And then lifting and looking and uh -huh. again and painting more. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then, of course, you have this problem where some of the paintings are so big I can't lift them, so I have to wait for someone to come over and help me. So I have this studio assistant who, um, I mean, it's not happening right now, but there was this time when he would come at 8.50 every morning, and we would let, move all the paintings for the day, and maybe if I was really lucky, he could come back. And that was that was it. Yeah. It's yeah, I have no lights either. It's really stupid. Photos changing kind of how you can see your work and how you take a picture of it and look at it on a phone and also have that same type of like channel break off and Yeah, I find, I've always taken photographs and I take photos like I, like you can see I'm showing you things in the studio, hundreds. I use them all the time. They, you know what they help me do more? They help me keep in touch with the paintings when I'm not there. So sometimes if I'm thinking about something, I just like to look at it or I like to see it, like when I'm teaching or I'm in traffic and I just need to tune in for a second. It helps. Um, sometimes I've used like markup on the phone to try stuff, but it's never really helpful for me. I'm, I'm a very analog person, um, but I think it, I also like seeing all the decisions I've made and, and maybe even the ones I didn't make. So, but photography is, it's a tool, yeah. So, uh, you said photography was a tool and I saw earlier that you're trying to photograph every day or you tell other people to do that? Yeah, I bring your camera everywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. How does that um, inspire your work? Like, do you photograph Yeah, I just, anytime there's something that's cool, I just photograph it. I always have, now I think a lot of people do this, it's not so unique. 
because the phone has a camera, but um, I did it when you had to carry a camera and it had film. And so it was, now it's just really easy, so it's great. But yeah, I'll just take a picture if I see something or, I mean, like today, like coming into the lobby and seeing like the stairs go up, 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 and then the sort of colonnades start. I took that picture or just stuff, anything that I, if I like it, I take a picture of it. Um, art that I see, stuff, I mean, you know, like I take all the pictures people take of food and animals and, you know, stuff, but I just take these pictures all the time. I, I was, I almost, I feel like there was a time in college when I was taking all these photography classes and maybe then started taking official painting classes and I didn't know what I was gonna do, but at one point painting kind of secretly won over photography because the darkroom work was so t boring or tedious and I felt like the, the, what I part, the part I liked was taking the picture and painting was always taking the picture so, but, but the role of photography has always been there as note taking. And I had a professor in, in graduate school, Barbara Rossi, who um, she, she kind of reified my experience of it and helped me formalize it because she did that. She had this project where she would go to India and she took all these pictures of ice cream cones, hand painted ice cream cone signs. And she has this arsenal of slides and she you know, would do this if you were a grad student, she would sometimes share her image bank of ice cream cones with you and it's like a typology of ice cream cones. And that was really um, special to understand that these pictures that I was taking and wanted to take could be cataloged into typologies and then when you do that, you can see the variety within the subject. So, you know, you take all this architecture and then you're like, wait, let's look at all the architecture I've taken. And then you're like, oh, wow, this is a way to chart and map what I'm attracted to. And you may not know it in the moment because you're just trying to follow the pure impulse, but the accrual of all the images, you're creating a visual notes. And so that's, yeah, so I use it for that reason, yeah. One more question? Okay. Um, what do you think is going to be the next step in your career? Or like, what do you think is like in your future? Like, like what I'm going to do in the studio, like show-wise? Like, yeah, like studio-wise, what do you think is coming up for this, anything, like either paintings or... My God, I have doing? no idea. Who, who knows? Right. You know, uh, I'm... I know, I know that the urgency to make a red painting isn't as strong anymore because I made that one and I feel like I kind of got what I wanted, whereas the urge of the pink painting, like, it doesn't stop. Like, I make one and I'm not satisfied. Like, I want another one. Like, there's a different urge there. Like, it's an insatiable urge with the pink paintings. Like, if I, if I nail it, I just want to nail it again. So I feel like I still want to follow that. I'm also interested in trying to figure out how to make a masterpiece. These are these like carrots, right? This, the masterpiece that's horizontal. Um, I would like, I hope that my interest in the lobster claws continues because I like the idea because I don't work very serially. I know I presented a lecture that may have created that, but I think like it really isn't. I'm just trying to trace things. So if I continued making those works, I'd be really excited, but I can't force it. If I don't have an idea or I'm not interested, it won't happen. I don't know, I hope, I hope something new happens. I don't know what that is, or it wouldn't be new. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>